Welcome to Building Remotely, the podcast where we talk with founders and leaders of remote companies. Together with them, we aim to uncover hidden insights that you can use when building a startup remotely. I'm your host, Sandre, the founder and CEO of SafetyWing, a Y Combinator-backed startup building a global social safety net for remote workers. Let's begin. Everything we're following with our lizard brain is not going to make us happy. And, and I think in terms of nomadism remote work, uh, again, being able to move to hubs where you can find a community of people, yeah, that's going to make you happy. Not the infinity pool and not the, you know, the nice food or the, the beaches. In this episode, I'm joined by Peter Levels, the founder of Nomad List and Remote OK. And at least for me, one of the founders of the digital nomad remote work world as it is today. If you're listening to this podcast, you probably already know who he is. And if not, then it's about time. Together with Peter today, uh, I will explore what is happening with remote work, what it means for the digital nomad scene in the future, and answer the question, are all remote workers future nomads? Welcome to the podcast, Peter. Thanks for having me, Sonne. So I first heard you speak as I was contemplating quitting my job and becoming a nomad at the DNX conference in 2015. And your talk was quite uh, informative because you predicted a future where we had 1 billion digital nomads by 2035. By the way, a figure The Economist later quoted and uh, we have used in our pitching. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that was caused, you said, by cheap air travel, more freelancers, remote workers, sharing economy, better internet and other things. So looking back, it's five years later now. We've had a lot of development since then. Would you update your prediction? Is that where we're still heading? I think so, yeah. It was five years ago. And in the last five years, I mean, I would say this year, a lot of things changed regarding remote work, obviously. But in the last five years, we've seen remote work grow like rapidly. It's become the standard for startups in San Francisco, in Silicon Valley. I think 70% of startup teams last year in Silicon Valley were part or mostly remote when they started out. So it became kind of the standard. And now with this year with Corona and stuff, uh, which is a terrible year for everybody, I think, but remote work has risen fast and it's become really common with normal companies, like regular companies, because they're forced to work remotely. And, you know, it's, it's not the best way to uh, get in touch with remote work, I think, because it's kind of forced upon people, right? But the reality is that they are working remotely now. They're working from home. And five years ago in that presentation about 1 billion digital nomads, my definition of digital nomad was a remote working person who would work away from their home country at least part of the year. So it wasn't like the traditional definition of digital nomad, which is like, you know, bouncing around from city to city every week. And I don't know anybody that actually does that. And I've said it multiple times, like people go crazy if you, if you do that. But the realistic definition of a digital nomad would be somebody living uh, part, part of the year working remotely from another country than their home country. And I think that's what we're seeing now happening. In America, there's now Zoom towns. I read in the New York Times, there's a new word, Zoom towns, and which means that people working remotely are moving to smaller towns, booking Airbnbs there. A lot of student kids in, in America, maybe Europe too, they're booking Airbnbs and living together because their entire course is now online and they're doing it remotely. So I would say, you know, I, I got a lot of flack for that prediction of 1 billion because it's kind of, you know, it's extreme. But I would say now a lot of people are like, ah, oh, maybe he was pretty close because it's only 2020. We still have 15 years to go. I think we can hit 1 billion for sure. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, you have vindicated there. <laughs> well, tell me a little bit more about that part with the cities and the, and the Zoom towns. You know, there is this almost premise for Nomad List, I find, which is that you, you go to Nomad List and the only reason you would look at cities, you know, with these parameters is that you have the freedom to choose kind of where to live, right? Yeah. That's kind of the premise for the site. So when did that occur to you that people would in the future choose cities, you know, almost like products? It didn't really occur to me. It was more of a solving my own problem because back then I was nomading a lot more rapidly than now, but this is like 2014. And I was in Chiang Mai, I was in Bangkok, I was in Vietnam, like those typical Southeast Asian places. And I was like, ah, interesting. Like these places are not the typical place you see on quality of life rankings. Like quality of life is like, you know, Scandinavia, Sweden, Denmark, Vienna, those kind of places. But these kind of places in Southeast Asia were more kind of fun. If you're young, you know, fun to live, fun to travel around. Uh, and you could work on your laptop a little bit. Uh, but I was thinking, okay, so if we set these criteria that are different from like typical quality of life rankings, 
but like criteria specifically for remote workers, which is like, you know, typical ones like internet speed, uh, safety, very important. You're sitting there with your laptop, right? What, what else? Weather, right? It's kind of nice to be in a mild or warm place. Most people like that weather. And then I started collecting all the data and trying to figure out like, is there other places that are like this? And that's been the premise of Nomad List for the last uh, few years, trying to figure out those places. And I think it's done a pretty okay job. Recently, recently I've added more like social data because you, you want to be with people like other remote workers in the same place. So the ranking is based more now also on, is there actually other nomads? Is there actually people there that you can uh, make friends with or find a partner or something, or at least find some community around you? Because that's very important with being away from home. So you also run, you know, remote OK, uh, which I believe is certainly one of the world's biggest remote work job sites. So you certainly see a connection between remote work and, and, and nomadism. Uh, what do you think, how do you define the connection? Yes, so the connection is interesting because I've been through that transition myself. My previous business was like a YouTube channel for music. This was like 2013. And back then I was in Amsterdam. I just graduated a master's degree and my friends would work in offices and I would work from home. And that was fun for a while, but then it got kind of boring. So I would work from cafes and you know, I'd work from the, the public library in Amsterdam, like a nice library, but it was still kind of boring. And then I thought, okay, I can work from different cities. So I'd work from different places. I'd work, you know, in my parents' city. I would visit friends around the country. And then you think like, okay, maybe you can do this in different countries. So I went to San Francisco. I lived there for a while, actually finishing my graduate paper, my thesis, and also working on my YouTube channel a little bit on my laptop. So I, I kind of proved that worked for me. And then I was like, okay, so I can pretty much go anywhere with this laptop and do my work. And as long as I make money, I can keep doing that. Uh, so the transition of being a work from home remote worker, which is a lot of people now, like during this 2020 year, the first time ever, because they went from office to work from home. And then to like, okay, this is fun, but actually we can also do it in a different place, in a different city or in a different country. I think that's the, the transition. And I'm not saying that 100% of work from home remote workers will you know, go through that transition or have to, you know, you don't need to, but I think let's say 10% or something or 5% of those people will do that. And that's interesting because that's like, you know, if you have the whole country working remotely and you have a labor population in America of, I don't know, 150 million or 200 million, that would mean something like 20 million uh, people that, you know, potentially would work from different countries or different cities. And I think that's the whole transition part. Yeah. Oh, and we're certainly seeing that in San Francisco. I'm mostly in San Francisco. And I think uh, something like 70% of my friends have left in the last six months. Yeah. So it, it's an exodus and uh, rents are down 31%. I mean, that's kind of extreme with San Francisco and the high rents and, and all of that. And some of them are just moving. They're relocating. Many are going on these kind of van road trips, very common. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some are moving to, you know, Tulum is a big one. Yeah. Uh, Austin, Denver, and many are, are going nomadic. So you definitely see that on the individual level. I think it might be higher even than five to 10%, but of course, San Francisco is a, it's not a, an average population segment. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think about companies? So many companies are now going remote. How do you think the evolution will go for companies who have switched to uh, work from home and then maybe to remote first now during COVID? Yeah. Well, I think that the big problem that companies have now is that, and this is so commonly described by other people like uh, David Heinemann Hansen and Matt Malowiec from WordPress, it's very difficult to have companies that are half remote, where like some people from the team work remotely and some people stay in the office. Culturally, that doesn't work because the people that work remotely, they're left out from the, the social gatherings and you cannot really replicate that online. So pretty much the opinion is you need to be either, you know, a physical office company, or you need to be a fully remote company uh, in terms of company culture. Where I see it happening now with these regular companies, like I'm from Holland, so I see a lot of Dutch companies do it now. You know, if there's no Corona lockdown, they will move slightly back to also working in the office again, and you will have to split in these teams. And I think that will be a really big problem in the future because these companies are like I said, they're going to have cultural problems between the people working on site and working remotely. No, we definitely see that. Well, well, in Safe Doing, we've been remote since day one, and my previous company was also fully remote. By the way, it's so interesting to see how with the previous company in the beginning, we had to keep it secret from investors almost that we were remote. <laughs> it's like 2016. Yeah. And now it's, I would say it's almost a plus. It's really interesting how, how culture changes and, you know, like, yeah, 
me and other people on Twitter and, and in social media and stuff and, and we've been blogs and stuff. We've been writing about it for a long time. You know, I, I was not the first at all. There's way more people before me. They were trying to push this remote work stuff and nomad stuff. And like the amount of flag we got and the amount of pushback we got was so huge, you know, even five years ago, it was like a fringe subculture. But I remember that every fringe subculture has potential to become mainstream because usually you're an early adopter that's to something that will absolutely not be accepted in the beginning by mainstream society. Even if you're in discussions with your friends in debates, they're like, no, this remote work will never work because this is this, and they'll find arguments. And then once it switches, they're not talking about it anymore. They are actually also working remotely and the discussion isn't even there anymore. You know what I mean? So it's so weird. You can always find arguments against things when that's not your culture, but then when the culture changes, you're like, okay, I'll do it too. So it's not really about the debate or the arguments. It's about the, the predominant culture in a society or in a work, um, which defines what people do. And, you know, of course that's herd mentality, which is completely normal, but it's so interesting to observe that over the last, uh, you know, six years. And I'm kind of grateful that I've been in that scene and that like the nomad scene or remote work scene that I've seen it evolve. And I've been a little bit of a part of it, of pushing it and that it actually worked out, or at least we're now in the middle of it, but it's actually kind of working out now. It's become, like you said, your, your investor is like, wow, that's cool that you work remotely, that your whole company is remote. It's completely changed. Yeah. No. And uh, I mean, it is somewhat sad, but it's curious, like what you said, that when you get pushback, what you're really getting pushback for is people just sensing that this isn't mainstream and therefore they don't yeah. like it because they like popular things, I suppose. But I guess that's a bit unconscious as well. How do you personally feel most comfortable on the fringe or your stuff is, you know, going mainstream rapidly? Are you happy about that or do you wish you would stay on the fringe? Yeah, it's a funny question. I was talking to it with, with a friend yesterday about it. It's fun to be in this fringe subculture or scene where, like, I come from electronic music. So, like, underground music, the whole point is that it's not mainstream. The whole point is that you're, like, with people in this niche. Like, for example, I was in drum and bass music, which is this niche, and it's not really commercial. You can't really make money with it. It's supposed to be underground. And, you know, when there's a big pop music drum and bass hit, you're like, yeah, you know, that's commercial. That's too mainstream. So the whole point of a French scene is kind of that it's cool to be in this subculture that's like different. It's always a, it's a counterculture to work. Like it's counter against the dominant culture of the mainstream. And then of course, you know, you're building a business. So of course you want to, you think it's a thing for good, like remote work. So you want to push it and you do push it and you make a business around it. You make multiple business around it like I did. And then suddenly it's mainstream and then you're like, wow, okay. Like this was part of my identity and now it's kind of like normal and now you need to find something else that's like, you know, underground or different, but that's the whole point, right? That's the point, like that's the point of culture that changes and startups too, like startups are, this is so integral to startups, I think, and you know that too, from founding a startup where you start something because there's something missing from the market, but also maybe missing from the culture and you push that. And by pushing that, you actually create a market, right? And then you have a product to sell. So it's integral, but it, yeah, it's. I miss the, I miss a little bit the romantic, you know, feelings of six years ago or something, but it's, it's temporary. It's always temporary. It's like early nineties hip hop or something, you know, in New York, in the, in the East coast, those are like moments that I will never forget. And, you know, we're still in the middle of it. It's still growing, but now it's up to me also to find new stuff. That's like fringe or different to build a business around or a culture around, you know, and I don't think thinking a lot about that recently, of course. I definitely reflect on that myself. I like the romantic phase, but of course you want your business to succeed and and therefore yeah, it's yeah. kind of good. But anyway, mixed bag. If it would stay romantic, your business would not succeed. It would uh, probably be stable because it, it wouldn't grow. Exactly. And in a way, then it wouldn't be true what I thought either. Exactly. So it would die out anyway, like a scene either becomes mainstream or it dies out. Yeah. It's just a reality. So I wasn't going to ask this, but I'm just curious personally, because I, you know, had this, you know, dilemma in starting a startup and, you know, bootstrapping or going venture funding. And I opted for venture funding, not for any kind of great reason, in a sense, like I saw the benefits of bootstrapping a lot, like you have, and we wanted to build a company that's very different that people wouldn't understand. I thought for a long time, I still kind of think so, and that there are, you know, big downsides of venture funding. And I kind of thinking that that could be overcome. I, I still think Y Combinator works, like that works for bootstrapping, but the rest of venture funding, you know, is certainly a mixed bag. Uh, so how do you think about that venture funding versus bootstrapping? What's your uh, short take there? Yeah, from people that know me, like I'm obviously a bootstrapper, I've never raised funding. I've never 
borrowed, you know, loans from the bank or something. It's all been revenue, putting it back into the business or mostly, yeah, putting it back into buying coffee and food for myself so I can code more <laughs> and, and not even hiring a lot. Like I, I don't have, uh, have some contracts, but it's, it's very temporary and stuff. So uh, in terms of bootstrapping versus funding, I don't know, like yesterday I tweeted about it as well. If you look at the exit odds of selling your, your startup, the percentages, you know, they differ, like differ how you see the data sets, but I think it's something like, you know, zero to 10%. And if you think that a startup takes about, you know, let's say five years to do, then you need to be doing startups for 50 years to get one exit. But then you'd have a big exit, you have millions and stuff. So the odds are pretty low for individual founders. But then when you have VCs themselves, most VCs, they have a negative return compared to the stock markets as a diverse, you know, if you buy a stock market ETF of the S&P 500, the return will be higher than investing in regular VC funds. So that's kind of negative too. Then you have the venture capitalists, they make money on management fees, which is, I don't know, something like 3% per year, 5% per year on the whole fund. So if you have a $100 million fund, you get $5 million a year, maybe in management fees. You know, that's a really good business for a venture capitalist. And then you have the giant investors, like the pension funds that invest 10% of their money into these high risk uh, venture capital portfolios. And they need it because they need part of their portfolio to be high risk because 90% is in you know general stock and, and bonds and low risk stuff because you don't wanna you know, lose people's retirement money. And these are like trillion dollar funds that, you know, especially in Europe, there's a lot of retirement funds. So this money needs to be invested and they need to be exposed to high risk. So the point is 10% of this money is, is exposed to this venture capital stuff. And that's good for them because it increases uh, the interest, the return they have. But for individual founders, because the odds are so low that you exit, I'd say, unless you have some, you know, really unfair advantage, I think, yeah, I wouldn't do it personally. I would say start small, uh, bootstrap. And even if you bootstrap and you make money, you could raise, like I could raise VC money now with my revenue, for example, like proving like, look, this is a real business. Even then I could also reinvest the revenue and grow the revenue myself. And because it's bootstrapped, you're so tapped into the market as a signal where anything you do to your startup or website, you immediately see if it works or not because you make money on it or not. It's a very direct connection to the market. And with venture capital, you have all this money on your bank account. You know, you can spend it on all these things and there's not a lot of incentive, especially in the beginning to, you know, build revenue or profit. And that makes it a more vague connection to the market. So pretty much you can do a lot of, you know, BS as a startup. And I think that's a disadvantage. That's so interesting that you would base it on something so, you know, statistically rigorous as that. So like listening to you say that argument, the statistical argument, uh, you know, for, for bootstrapping, I... You know, I'm thinking, I think I'm thinking kind of what every founder is thinking, which is, well, I'm not a random, I'm, I'm, a, I'm not sort of, I'm not uh, like a random person out of. Yeah, you're not a statistic. Everybody thinks they're different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really funny. Yeah. I guess you kind of have to as well. Like you have to believe in yourself too, because otherwise you're not going to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was talking to a, a website broker about this because they buy up websites and his most common thing he has is that he'll talk to a company founder, like a, usually a bootstrap founder, and the bootstrap founder is so in touch with their own business, just like I am. And you kind of think like, wow, this is like a special project. This is like different. But generally he pays three to four to five times the annual revenue. That's the valuation. And the founders, they think that their thing is special and it is special for them, but it's, you know, to the market, it's just a normal business. And, you know, it's not special. <laughs> Well, safe doing is special for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, normally it's super special to me. Like I wouldn't sell it. It's my baby. And yeah, it's really funny. It's his bias. So back to nomadism. So we have this sort of general connection, you know, of remote work opening up for nomad. Now I just wanted to talk a little bit about why go nomad. What are the key reasons? Why do people want to do it? Yeah, a really good question. From what I can see around me, people, for, for me, it was the possibility that it was possible. My life was fine in Amsterdam. I was like, I was pretty happy. I was, I was bored because I already started working. But generally, like I had a big friend group. We do a lot of stuff. I was making music. It was, it was fun. But I thought, okay, like I want to see the world. I want to see different cultures. I want to travel. I want to meet new people. I want to, I want to live life in a little bit more of a different way. I wouldn't say better, but I would say different. Like you want to have adventures and stuff. 
And I felt that, you know, kind of like Fight Club, like the nine to five office and, and doing that, this routine, like I would go crazy from that. And I see the benefit of it. I see the benefit of routine now even more, but my brain wasn't really, doesn't really work with that. And my brain is a little bit, I guess, creative and hyper and <laughs> it wants to, it wants to do different stuff. And especially when you're, you know, in your twenties for sure, like then, you know, of course you want to see the world for sure. So I think that's one of the reasons that it's possible and that you, you know, you want to have an exciting life. I think other reasons are that where people are born, like for me, I was born in Holland, then I moved to Amsterdam. Netherlands is a great place to live. A lot of people don't live in great places. You know, a lot of people live in places that are not so great and, and they could potentially have better lives elsewhere, like with people they like, for example. The social communities in the place where you're born might not fit precisely with the social communities that you're supposed to be with. So for example, if your hobby is, I don't know, like anime, like I don't like anime, but a lot of people like anime cartoons in Japan, live for a while in Japan. If you like Thai food, maybe you should go live in Thailand and do a lot of cooking classes and stuff. If you like jiu-jitsu fighting, maybe you should go live in Brazil and be coached by all these Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, masters, right? So there's a lot of things, a lot of reasons, purposes to move to places for your hobby or for your, your goals in life or for changing the community of people around you to fit more with the people you want. And I think that's one of the main reasons. Yeah, that's interesting. So if that's true, that means that the stages of the future will be much more sort of differentiated by interest, probably even more than today because it will yeah. be self-reinforcing. I think so. And you see it in America now a lot with these Zoom towns that a lot of the snowboard people, they move to ski resorts, which becomes Zoom towns. I think Lake Tahoe has snow as well in the mountains, uh, Denver, Colorado, Boulder, Colorado, of course, love skiing there, snowboarding, you know, surfers, like I'm in the surf town now in Portugal, surfers, they live to fly to places where there's specific waves, specific types of surfing with the surf community. So we've already had a lot of these examples happening before even, you know, laptops and nomads and stuff. People are already doing it, this purpose-based travel or moving. A curious thing that, you know, sometimes I misclick on nomad list because you can have overall score and then you can like click a button and then you, <laughs> you view from the bottom of the list instead of the top. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so it's fun to view that, you know, when you think about quality of life and how much it costs, there's like some cities that are the worst. I remember it was some city in Chad or something that I was like, <laughs> it was just uh, expensive, bad internet, no fun, no safety. Yeah. And I think it's a war zone, so yeah, but I have to check that. But yeah, there's a lot of places that are not good to live. And it, it really sucks if you're born in, in specific places that are not great to live. And, and that's a global thing. Like migration has been part of human history, you know, always in different ways. And this is also part of migration. Yeah. So in a way, it's this accelerated migration that may also happen now, you know, in the coming years, right? As people kind of yeah. resort into new cities. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. What about some of those edge cases? Just to briefly mention that, if you kind of take them one by one, the demographic of digital nomads, uh, digital nomads in retirement, what about families and schooling? Take those two. Well, I think the kids thing is a really big thing now. It's kind of like the second wave of nomadism is 2014. The first wave is like 2007 with Tim Ferriss. I feel like the second wave is kind of ending now and now we're in the third wave after Corona. A lot of people are, you know, late twenties or, or even late thirties and stuff they're having kids or they want kids, for example. Uh, it's a great question. I think in a way the education is not ready yet. And this is like a kind of like a request for startup where ideally what you'd have if you have kids and you you live in like a few different places maybe, or you, know, you work remotely, ideally what you'd have is a centralized online coursework, for example, done by Harvard or by a company that's you know certified and you have proper education for kids, uh, for teenagers. And then you'd have practical, you know, physical actual classes, like local classes. And maybe you could do this with affiliate uh, schools that would use that coursework and then do the practical class where also the, the kids have like the social environment of other, meeting other, other kids and stuff. And then you have something that might work. So an online part and an offline part. Uh -huh. So this is one of the key unsolved things, kind of. Are there any other unsolved things you want to highlight? Any other requests for startups? Well, healthcare, but I mean, your team is working on it really, really fast. I think the kids thing, the education thing is a big thing and that needs to be solved because education quality differs so wildly from country to country and place to place, especially in places which are 
like I said, like the high quality of living, like let's say you move to Vienna, you will have great education. Let's say you move to a place that's really good for living for remote workers, it might not have that. There's international schools usually, and they're probably good, but it's also the people that go remote and that go nomad, they're always a little bit different, a little bit alternative. So they might want like Montessori education, for example. That's like, I was raised Montessori, those kind of education forms. So yeah, I'd say that's the unsolved problem. I can't figure out other unsolved problems at this moment, but there is loads. Like imagine the entire world or these 1 billion nomads going nomad or going remote and you'll find stuff that's challenging. I think community is still challenging. Like, uh, especially during Corona, a lot of people are lonely, but even if you're slow matting, if you, let's say you, you live in Bali and you live in Seoul half the time, like this is kind of what I do. It's still more challenging to build community than being in one place for, you know, 20 years because you have your friends and it's, it's this repetitive social proximity environment. So I think social is still, it's, it's still a really, really big challenge. And I think if you talk about these Zoom towns or these remote work hubs, I wouldn't say that a private party should establish this, like build like villages or cities or something. I don't think that works, you know, and I don't think, you know, if you've seen Wild Wild West, the Netflix documentary about this cult, I don't think this, these things kind of work, but facilitating these remote work hubs physically with services in some way, and I don't know exactly what, that would be, you know, a nice business too. Yeah. I love those. And there are some people I've talked to, you know, who are looking into the villages things both kind of uh, getting these some abandoned villages. And I mentioned in the previous episode, someone that we're helping out a little bit who are looking at castles in Europe, like this huge castle properties yeah, yeah. to build villages. It's a lot of maintenance. Americans always forget that these things cost a lot of maintenance. They cost more maintenance than the, the price probably. About these villages, I, so I read a book last month about these communes in the 1960s. And I think it's a little bit related, interesting. There was this journalist who made like a list of all these, there was like hundreds of communes, villages and stuff. And he, he would travel to America to, you know, try and analyze them, interview people there. And many times when he arrived, they'd already broken up. They'd already fallen apart because of just fighting, infighting and stuff. And I think it's this idealistic delusion that you can create this new community that won't have the problems of general society. You know, you'll be living with your friends and everything will be perfect, but it's not how it works. Like if you've ever had roommates, you know, that it's a lot of, you know, conflict and living together is really difficult. And that's why you have police and that's why you have ambulances and fire, uh, fire brigades. So I think it's, I did this book recommended, I think the book was called Do Nothing, How to Do Nothing. And this book, this writer recommended, instead of trying to create new villages, which reinvent the whole concept of society, try to iterate on the society you're currently living in. And I feel like that's a much more realistic and practical way to do it, which means that you know, going to a remote work up, building some roots there and improving the living situation there for you and the people around you. And, you know, it sounds very vague, but that could be, for example, open like a school for remote work kind of people or open a nice co-working, open a nice cafe, um, make sure the money goes back to locals. It's very important, that kind of stuff. So iterate on what's already there, I think is a much better proposal. No, I, I very much support that. I hope someone takes up that community mantle because I would totally join it, but I would want to be, you know, even in SF, I don't just want to go to an event, but I would like some, you know, to be where you could participate and like someone who were trying to do something and, and uh, that sort of community, I just, I haven't come across. Well, no, like it's the thing in America now for tech people to do like, oh, we're going to start a village, right? I think that in Chengdu, I felt the closest to that, you know, Chengdu is not perfect at all, but I felt the closest to this, this weird, cozy vibe of like people like you i know it's like a resort town you know it's like it's it's mostly foreigners so it's, it's just like in mexico you have these resort towns so it's not perfect it's, it's slightly problematic right if you want to go there but this feeling of like being with people that are creative entrepreneurial artistic ambitious you know active uh they want to do cool stuff they're making cool things and you can walk into them you can walk around well you can actually drive around like there's no sidewalks in changu but you can walk into the co-working spaces there and meet cool people really quickly and that's such a powerful, like, that's everything I think a lot of us miss when we're not in those kind of places. It's so difficult to do it in a big city. It's difficult to do it in Amsterdam. It's, it's difficult to do it in, in, well, SF actually, you do have that because there's so many of those similar kind of people, creative people, ambitious people in one spot. And I think it comes down to, again, like having people in a certain subset of culture or, you know, hobby, or in, in our case, like startups and, and creativity together. It's really fun to live on a day-to-day -day basis with those people in like a, like a small town. And 
it completely changes you. Working together, having those serendipitous connections, it's absolutely amazing. And I really want that. And and I, the only place I've, I've I felt it is in Changu in Bali. I felt it in Chiang Mai a little bit. You know, you said Tulum, those kind of places have it. I think if anything, that's the places we'll see become, you know, the nomad hubs now, they will probably become remote work hubs more. If anything, that's the place where it will happen. And I think, yeah, again, I, I don't think it will happen in artificially built places. Mm -hmm. It will happen in natural places. Yeah, organically. Yeah, it will happen organically. That does make sense. Yeah, I saw that was one of the sort of TLDR conclusions you took from a tweet you had about, uh, I believe it was a Robin Hansen article about yeah. remote yeah. work and its effects was these beach towns. So, okay, so that's super interesting. Another kind of big problem, I suppose, or maybe it's sometimes it's framed as a critique about nomads, but I think it's just a problem in our time, is sort of that many people are kind of, they're flaming out on like uh, chasing uh, pleasure and adventure. And you had this post where you posted an excerpt of this sort of Joe Rogan, Dan Bilzerian episode about the hedonic treadmill of chasing money and happiness, chasing the rainbow. What's your take on that? What's the alternative? Where are we going with that in the sort of pleasure versus meaning? Yeah, it's a really good, really good question. Um, and this year, I think everybody's been thinking about that because this year has been so introspective for you know everybody around me, people on the internet, because it's finally been time to think because you were forced to think uh, due to all the lockdowns and you couldn't do many things anymore. And I think it's bigger than you know nomads and traveling. It's it's Instagram, right? Instagram is this whole aesthetic purpose and pleasure, and then showing like, look how great my life is. And you know, nomadism has been sold like that for years as well. Like uh, you know, live your dream lifestyle on the beach. You know, buy this course for three thousand dollars, and it's not like that because it's you know that you go to a beach and it's really boring, kind of. Like it's nice to see the sunset maybe, but. It gets kind of boring. Swimming in an infinity pool in Singapore on that big hotel, that's fun, but then it's really boring as well. And, and a lot of these things that are, you know, that look nice aesthetically, they're kind of boring. And it comes down to, like I said before, like the people around you, like having the, the right people around you, that's pretty much the only thing that's going to make you happy, I think, and meaningful work and, you know, like being healthy, like working out and stuff. But all the other stuff, like buying things, I think somebody wrote that materialism in millennials and generation Z is being replaced by like experientialism, but it's still the same thing. So we're like, oh, you know, you should do experiences. That actually makes you happy because there's like studies on that. Yeah. But you know, all this endless hedonistic travel and infinity pools, that's also materialism pretty much, especially when you're sharing it on Instagram and that's not going to make you happy. So again, like I think people makes you happy. Meaningful work makes you happy. Sports makes you happy, you know, all this other stuff like meditation, having a therapist actually works really good for your mental health, of course. Uh, everybody should have a therapist, I think. But yeah, we are in this generation because it's marketing, right? It's, it's what sells. And our lizard brains click on things that sell, that look nice and that are like looking perfect and, and they're idealistic. But our lizard brain cannot properly choose the things that are actually going to make us happy. Like actually what's going to make you happy is going onto the street, talking to people, making friends, talking to your partner or finding a partner or something or multiple partners, who cares? It's 2020, but uh, those things will make you happy and, and finding work that is fulfilling, you know, that gives you meaning. I heard somebody say like, he has a really big team and a lot of people depending on him that to not mess up the company because they would be without a job, right? That's like meaning. All these things are meaning or making beautiful arts that gives you intrinsic happiness while making it. Flow states, you know, those things. So. Everything we're following with our lizard brain is not going to make us happy. And I think in terms of nomadism, remote work, again, being able to move to hubs where you can find a community of people, yeah, that's going to make you happy. Not the infinity pool and not, you know, the nice food or the, the beaches. Mm -hmm. So it's about getting to a place where you can find a community and finding friends that you find meaningful to and, uh, you know, enjoy spending time with. But let me get, a, you know, some more details on this about finding meaningful work. You know, you've certainly done that. And I imagine that's why a lot of people look to you, I suppose, because you seem to um, make these choices like, you know, this is what meaningful work is, like the way you build Nomad List and then and bootstrapping it. And then you sort of live your own philosophy in a way, in a consistent way. And so, but the question I suppose, you know, a lot of people are wondering about is, well, because they at the same time have to solve the problem of making enough money, right? Yeah. They find that the meaningful work thing comes, it comes after the first one. 
And then the first one becomes this kind of ever optimizing where they want to advance in their career and then they kind of find themselves in a non-meaningful work situation, maybe, and they're open to change. So how did you find meaningful work and how would you recommend to others to do that? Yeah, I know what you mean. So it's like a position of luxury, right? To say like, oh yeah, my work is meaningful, but you should all find that and it's easy to say. But you can also have a regular job and you can do volunteer work on the side, which will give you meaning. It won't pay you money, but it's very meaningful. A lot of tech people can do volunteer work, even online. There's like websites where you can go and you can build a website for like a library and that's going to give you meaning. You can do, you know, IRL, physical volunteer work, for example. So I don't think necessarily the meaningful work has to be your main job. I think that's like what everybody wants, but it's very difficult to attain it, right? But there's other ways. So let's say you were trying to attain it. Like if someone's listening to this and they want to find meaningful work, that's their main job. Well, it's really difficult because, so I had a music career, right? And it worked out a little bit, like I could pay my bills and stuff. And especially with YouTube, it paid my bills, but I didn't become like a global touring DJ producer or something, working with Justin Bieber or whatever, right? So that didn't work out because the chance of that is so small. But for me, making music was very meaningful work. It was like amazing and I still like it, right? So the things you find meaningful are not always going to have a market fit. So music for me had somewhat of a market fit, but not I wasn't good probably enough or something or whatever. It didn't work out. Building these different websites, I mostly started out trying to solve my own problems, right? Like which city can I go next as a nomad or all these other projects? So because I picked problems for my own life, they were kind of meaningful, but it might as well happen that, that something else, some other project took off that wasn't meaningful. So I was kind of lucky in that. So I don't know if it's, I would say it's probably luck that it's meaningful for me, that it's like this remote nomad movement is very meaningful, but you might as well build something that's not meaningful for you <laughs> and that makes a lot of money. And I mean, Remote OK, for example, is a job board. And for me, I would say nomad is way more meaningful because it's like this philosophical, emotional backdrop behind nomad list, like this changing world, right? With these remote work hubs. Remote OK is, is more boring, but it's very necessary because people need to find remote jobs. So I guess the answer is it's very difficult. It's very difficult to find market fit with building stuff. It's very difficult to find jobs that are exactly what's meaningful for you. I wouldn't focus on that in your life completely. I would focus on finding meaning, first of all, from people. It's very cliche, but it's true. Hmm. All right. Well, I'm mindful of the time. and That's a great place to end. I uh, very much appreciate everything you've done for the sort of nomad remote work uh, world. And I'm curious to see what next thing you're interested in, because I suppose as you're looking towards the future to see what the next thing is, uh, it'd be <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> interesting to see what that is. I haven't worked it out yet. That's the problem. So I need to do a lot of thinking and a lot of talking to people and figure something out. So maybe it might take five years, right? It might take 10 years. So, Well, the first uh, prediction is still uh, in the middle of coming to fruition. So I hope you can uh, stay focused on that for a little while longer. There's a lot of problems yeah. to solve. So thanks a lot for joining. And uh, what are you working on right now where people can, where we would direct people in addition to Nomad List and, and Remote OK? I would say go to those sites first, figure out what's going on there. I'm building a new secret project. I cannot announce yet. It, I will launch it, I think, tomorrow or the day after. I've been working on it secretly a little bit. It's completely different, so it's not nothing with remote work. But yeah, I would say go to nomadlist.com and check out there. And that's where pretty much the center of all this stuff is a little bit for me. And thanks so much for having me. And thanks also so much for the Safety Wing supports like my websites. It's really cool. Uh, it's been really yeah. beneficial for me. And the website's keeping them up. And um, yeah. Super cool. Thanks for having me. All right. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the conversation. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. For more insights into building a successful remote company, head to buildingremotely.com. There you will find episode notes, articles, and book chapters. You can also subscribe to future episodes and recommend guests we should invite. See you in two weeks for the next episode of Building Remotely.